Good morning. I'm Gregory Johnson, minister of the Shelby Valley Church of Christ. <clears throat> it is so thankful to have you with us, you that are watching on WPRG TV, those on Facebook, and those on YouTube. I thank you so much for being with us uh, this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I pray each day that God will bless me as I preach his word, that I will do it in a manner that is acceptable to him and that will benefit you, the, the hearer. And I pray for you that hear. Um, you know, as the Lord said in John 8 and 32, said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And <clears throat> I and God want you to be free from the sin that overwhelms us all. Um, and condemns us. Um, and before I forget, today is Mother's Day, and I want to thank my mother and wish her a happy Mother's Day. And, and you that are mothers, I wish you a happy birthday, and uh, I pray that God will bless you this day. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' precious name, I thank you for all of those that are with us this morning watching. Uh, I ask you, to, Father, to bless them, not only bless them, but bless their families. Father, I ask you to bless all those that are mothers, Father, and the wonderful role that they play in our lives. Father, I want to thank you for the blessings of life and, and the mercies you've shown us in so many ways. The greatest gift of all and the greatest mercy you've shown us through Jesus, your Son, and we thank you, Father. Father, I ask your blessing upon this congregation at Shelby Valley, its members and their families, and those that are assembled with us and their families. Bless them, Father, to come hear and obey. Father, <clears throat> we ask your blessing of the sick. We ask your healing of them, if it be your will, and there are many that have asked for healing. I, I can't at this time name them all, but... I visited Brother Wayne Elkins in the hospital last night. He's in a serious condition. I, I humbly ask that you help him and bless him. You have blessed him to become your son, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, bless his brother Tom and his family. Bless that whole family. They just lost a bro brother-in-law, Glay Polly. Uh, comfort them in their loss. Father, bless all those that are sick, as Ryan is. Brother Eldon and, and uh, Michelle Wright, and there are many, Father. Carl Wright, there are many that are in the hospital or home that are sick. I ask your healing of them, Faye Gooden. Uh, bless them, Father, with healing. Bless this great nation we live in. Bless its leaders that they lead us in a righteous manner, Father. Bless the people of Ukraine. Bless there to be peace there. And bless the killing and, and the pain and the suffering to come to an end. Father, bless us through this day and this week to come. Bless me in this sermon this day, Father, that I speak your truth. And that the hearer will hear it, Father, and will apply it to their lives. I pray that be the case. Humbly ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. And amen. Today, the title of the sermon is Repentance. Uh, Webster tells us that it is a repenting, which is to repent. And he also tells us that it is, uh, uh, that it is something that we feel sorry about or have regret over, some past action in our life, something we've done, and uh, some kind of mistake or error we've made or some kind of sin. Um, and when we repent, we change our mind about the, the wrongful deed we've done or doing, and uh, that is repenting, when we change, make a change. Uh, repentance is when a person with a good heart becomes or comes face to face and realizes that they've made an error, that they've made a mistake or they've sinned, 
and they regret it. They regret what they've done and they don't want to continue in sin or, or error. They want to change and that change is repentance. When you, when you make that change, when, when this sorrow in your heart for your mistakes and errors makes you want to change and, and be a better person, then it's a, it's a change of mind, it's a change of heart, and it results in a change of behavior. We conduct ourselves differently if we have repented. <clears throat> Repentance is what that's all about. In God's Word, the Bible, it has a lot to say about repentance. Uh, the gospel is preached to make known the, the presence of sin. I haven't done my responsibility as a, as a minister of the gospel of Christ if I don't first import, inform people of the sin that's in their lives. And I don't say that to be mean to them or critical. I say that to help them. We must know what's broken before we can fix it. And in our lives, we've got to know the wrong that exists. And as the Apostle Paul said over in the Roman letter, uh, 3 and 23, I think it is, said that all have sinned. So, uh, you know, I did, you have. And if you've been forgiven of those sins through your obedience, uh, that's one thing. But if you have not, you still have those sins. And I want to make you aware of that. You can't change your behavior if you don't know what's wrong. And God's Word gives us instructions in life. Uh, as Paul told Timothy, I don't have that part of my sermon, but it's part of God's Word, is that uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, verse 17. But we, we have his word. It tells us of God's righteousness. Over in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, I think it is, it tells us that, that when we transgress one of God's laws, when we have broken a commandment, that we sin. And that is sin. The transgression of the law is sin, it says. And... So you need to know what sin is. You need to know if you've done it, and I can assure you you have because Paul has assured us, as I quoted you there or told you there from Romans 3 and 23, it says all of sin. I did. I needed forgiveness. I needed to repent and change and stop sinning, stop being in error, and follow after God's Word. God's Word is righteous. It is the right thing for mankind to do. It is the right way for us to conduct ourselves and to behave. So we need to, we need to read the Word. We need to understand that we have sin in our lives. And if I've done my job correctly, I'm going to um, encourage you that you have sin in your life. because Not because of me, but because that's what God's Word tells us. So... As we go into the Word and as we uh, receive God's Word, God's Word informs of us of our shortcomings, but it's a two-edged sword. It also tells us of God's love and, and that we can come out of sin, that we can come away from that, that we can change, that we can repent. And if we stay faithful unto death, heaven could be our home. <clears throat> I like this statement over in Romans 2 and 4. Here, Apostle Paul has sent a letter to the Romans and, and the church at Rome, and he is, uh, he is uh, counseling them from God inspiring him. And he says down in Romans 2 and 4, the latter part of that verse, he says, The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Now that's a pretty deep few words there. What leads you to repentance? God's goodness. That's what the preaching of the gospel is all about. It is God's good news. But part of that preaching is to tell you that you need the good news, that you need the love of God, that you need repentance, you need to change. And when we preach the love of God, God sending His Son down here is, um, 
John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God sent us a Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what the angels announced to the shepherds when they appeared to them about Jesus' birth, that God had sent a Savior. And they informed man of that. But God's goodness, getting back to this statement here and the depth of it, God's goodness, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. When you know, you know, I can't preach the love of God and the goodness of God and the mercy of God too much. I can't tell you too much about that. I can't be too passionate about that. You need to know and understand how much God loves you. You know, for, for Jesus to go to the cross and die the horrible death he did and be a, a sacrifice for our sins and took our sins upon him, you need to know and understand that and what love was behind that that made that possible for you and for me. And if we truly understand that, that it will lead us to change. We'll see that living righteous and living godly and being holy as he is holy is what we need and what we should want in our lives. And that will help change us. When we see that love of God, truly see it and feel it and know that it's there for us, for me, for you. Do you really feel the love of God? I hope you do. If you think on it, if you read and study and think and listen, you will know the love of God. And if you know that, then it will help you to change. John also writes that we love him because he first loved us. It is so important that I or other ministers help you to understand how much God loves you. And it is a tremendous love. It is an amazing love. No wonder we sing the song Amazing Grace or How Great Thou Art. We can't praise God too much. God is God and besides him there is none else. And what is so amazing is that he chose to love us. And in return, if we truly know and understand how much he loves us, we can't help but love him in return, as the scriptures tells us. And that, an important part of that is this repentance, this understanding, and it brings about change, repentance. And that's the very importance of the sermon today. And repentance is very, very, very important. Jesus, in his own words, over in Luke 24 and 47, says there that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning first at Jerusalem. And it did start at Jerusalem. We know that if we read Acts chapter 2, when the apostles were gathered together and the Holy Spirit, they were endued with the Holy Spirit, then <clears throat> that was the beginning of what was to come of the kingdom and the church. It was to begin, and Peter and the others stand up, and Peter mainly, as it focuses on his, what he had to say there, in the second chapter, he goes on to tell them about Jesus and, and the wonderful signs and wonders and things he did. And, and um, those miraculous things he did. And then he also tells them of the wicked things he had done. He too informed them of their sins like, like I should as a good minister of the gospel of Christ. People need to understand the terrible nature of, of the things they have done and the life they have lived outside of the Christ and outside of God's uh, commandments. And uh, we, we can do and we can understand that through the word, just as I read you here. Uh, Peter preached to those at Pentecost that this man approved of God by miracles, wonders, and signs that they had by wicked hands crucified and slain. And in verse 36, God says there that God had made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts 
verse 30, 36, or 37, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 38 of Acts chapter 2, a very important verse, Peter there says, Repent. Well, that's the title of our sermon, Repentance today. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And as I read earlier, Jesus said that the gospel should be begin to be preached at Jerusalem. And it was, as we reference and we read here in Acts chapter 2. We know that to be true. Some 3,000 souls were saved that day. They were convinced by Peter's preaching of the gospel and <clears throat> that God loved them and that he gave his son for them. And they received his word and were baptized. Baptized into Christ. Baptized for the remission of their sins. As Peter had told them, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. To get rid of them, to, to make them go away. He goes on in verse, and says in verse 42 of chapter 2 of Acts that they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and that they, <coughs> doctrine and fellowship. They had repented. They had changed. They had a change of heart and they had a change in their behavior. Uh, and as we go on and read in scripture and understand further gospel teachings and preaching, we know that you become a new creature, a new creature in Christ Jesus. If we want to make heaven, we cannot continue in life to live in sin. We must change. We must repent. <clears throat> to realize our sins and change, it is so important. Jesus makes that known, and it's emphasized what he says, uh, that the importance of repentance over in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5. It repeats the same verse twice. Do you think that's important? Do you think that's putting emphasis on repentance? It certainly is. We must change. And the, the whole story there is we can't continue in sin. Sin's not going to enter into heaven. Nothing that defiles is going to be there. Sin is not going to be there. If we have sin to our account and in our lives, then we're not going to be there. So we need to understand that. And we need to know what Jesus says here. He says, nay. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He goes on to repeat that again in first, first, um, verse 5. You cannot, you cannot continue in sin. Uh, you must have remission of your sins and be baptized as they were on the day of Pentecost in the name of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And as I read earlier, Jesus said the gospel will begin to be preached at Jerusalem, and it certainly was. Peter and the other apostles began that day of Pentecost. Uh, and here we, as I said a moment ago, some 3,000 souls uh, were convinced by Peter's preaching of the gospel <clears throat> that God loved them and gave his son as a sacrifice for their sin. They received his word and were baptized. They, they believed it. Uh, they, they believed that what they were being told was God's truth. And they uh, responded accordingly. And they continued in that doctrine uh, that they were taught by the apostles. We must repent, we must change. To realize our sins and change is oh so important. We, even Jesus himself there puts much emphasis on the fact that we must change, that we must repent. As you think on what Jesus said in, in this verse, be mindful of the love of God and, and his love towards sinful man. Uh, God, I remember what you, Peter wrote to the Romans in 5 and 8, God commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. What's God's thoughts toward sinful man? 
He loves him. He wants him to come out of sin. That's the whole purpose of sending Jesus Christ so that we could change, that we could repent, that we could live a different life and be holy as he is holy. Over in 2 Peter 3 and 9, Peter writes there of God's love and his will toward us and his intent toward us. Spells it out very plainly. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. Long-suffering to us, sir. Not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want you lost. If you're one of his children, he wants you to remain faithful unto death and heaven will be your home. If you're not one of his children this morning, if you've not heard, believed, repented, confessed Jesus as a Christ, been buried with him in baptism, he wants you to do that. Jesus come to die for you so that you could be saved, so that you would repent, and that heaven would be your home. God loves you. And as Peter's writing here, he says, he's not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want you lost. He doesn't want any lost. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? The title of our sermon today, repentance, change. He's wanting you to be holy as he is holy. He's, you're going to be his child. Heaven's going to be your home if you remain faithful unto death. But we as his children have a, have a battle. The devil is a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is after us. He wants to take us down, take us out of the church, take us away from God. He is an enemy. He's an enemy of ours and he's an enemy of God. God will deal with him in his time. But sin, righteousness and goodness and sin makes a separating of the wheat and the rye, the chaff and the rye, uh, the good and the bad. There's a trial of our faith that is much more precious, Peter writes, than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise, honor, and glory in the appearing of Jesus Christ. These trials of faith we go through, these, these persecutions that we as God's children endure, we're going to be so thankful when Jesus appears because we are going to be in his glory also. In Acts 17.30, it says there that God now commandeth all men everywhere to what? Repent. Change. He's telling you, you've got to change. You can't continue. If you're out there this morning living in sin, you can't have a hope of heaven without repenting, without changing and living righteously and holy. And it is the right way to live. Stealing or thieving or sexual deviation or uh, deviancy or, or promiscuity. There's no good in them. There, there's, there may be a short-term pleasure, but the end is children are brought into this world that should not have been. Things are done that it should not have been. Homes are broke up. Uh, and the same thing with alcoholism or drugs or any of the things that that we abuse our bodies and that we do that is wrong. God doesn't want you to do that. He wants you good things for you. He loved you enough that he sent his son so you can have good eternally. And you can. You know, I gave you the example of pen people, some 3,000, that, that made a change. They repented and were baptized on the day of Pentecost. Uh, but there's another example I'd like to tell you about uh, in the few minutes I have left. <clears throat> in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1, we read about the word, and maybe by telling you the story of Jonah, it might help you more in, in understanding repentance, although I think by now you should have a good understanding. But listen to this story of Jonah. Uh, in the first chapter, the first verse, we read about the word of the Lord coming to Jonah. And in verse 2, telling him, the Lord tells Jonah to arise and to go into Nineveh and cry against the city for the wickedness for it to come up before the Lord. 
But in verse 3, he rises up, but he doesn't go to Nineveh. He rises up and flees to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and then Joppa finds a ship to Tarshish. Verse 4, the Lord sent out a great wind, a mighty tempest in the sea, so that your ship was likely to be broken. Verse 5, then they were afraid and cried every man unto his God. Verse 8 and 9, then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, whose cause, whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation, and <clears throat> whence comest thou? When is thy, what is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord and God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Verse 6. Verse 16, verse 15, rather. The men cast Jonah forth <clears throat> into the sea, and it becomes calm. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God prepared a lot of things. He's prepared heaven for us if we'll repent and be faithful unto death and obey the gospel. Chapter 2 starts out with Jonah praying to God out of the fish's belly. Yeah, I see a lot of people when they get in hard times, they go to their knees and they start praying. And Jonah did too. Then Jonah on down to verse 7, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Lord has the fish vomit Jonah out upon dry land after his prayer. In the third chapter, the word of the Lord comes a second time to Jonah telling him to go to Nineveh and preach. And the fourth day, and in four days, Nineveh will be overthrown if they don't repent. The pe people, you know, if you don't repent and change and you continue to live in sin, your, your destination is already sure. Hell awaits people that will not obey the gospel. As best I can read the scriptures. This example here tells you what was going to happen. If they didn't repent, they were going to be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed God and turned from their evil and violent ways. Well, that's a change. God changed his mind and did not destroy them. In this story of Jonah, we have him repenting. He changed his mind when he was in the belly of the well and saw that what he had done was not right with God. When he was called the next time, he went and he did as God commanded him to do. And we see the people of Nineveh repenting. They changed from the evil ways and they lived. God let them live. You know, the preaching of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> to those that believe and obey, that have heard, that have believed, repented, and aware of their sins and regret their actions and know that they're not living right uh, and confess Jesus as a Christ and are buried with him in baptism. We as Romans 6 and 6 says, when we do that and are baptized into Christ, we crucify the old man or woman that we were. We become a new creature. We're no longer, those sins are no longer to our account. It's like we're a new baby and we don't have any sins. We didn't do those things because God forgives us. Paul, in, in 5.17, where Paul, 2 Corinthians, where Paul tells us that we are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're a new creature. But to hear the preaching of the gospel, it is, it is also a condemnation to them that hear and will not obey. Because they know better. To him that knoweth to do good, doeth it not. To him it's sin. When I'm telling you the truth, God's truth, and you will not accept it, it's sin, and you're in trouble. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 41, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that have walked the streets of heaven, been with the Heavenly Father, and came down to this earth, a greater than Jonas was here. And he had spoke with them, and he had taught them, and he died for them, and he arose for them. 
Jesus is not some man that died 2,000 years ago and that's it. No, Jesus died and arose again to live evermore. And we too can live evermore. But we must obey. We must hear, believe, repent, change, confess Jesus as the Christ, and be buried with him in baptism for the remission of our sins. I pray that you will do that. If this congregation will be of help to you, we will come here. I'll come here at 3 in the morning and baptize you if that's the only time you can make it. We want you to be a child of God, part of our family, part of God's family. Please come. I thank you for your attention and being with us. God bless you. Have a happy Mother's Day, you mothers.